Hello, everybody. So, it uh, looks like I'm live. That's good. Um, let me know if something's wrong with the sound, yes or no. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, for tonight, uh, I'm going to try and create um, an image from scratch. Now, I don't know if it's going to work out. It might take too long. But basically, it's going to be in the same vein as some of the ones that I did uh, the last few days. So, um, yeah, I've got a few here that I did. Uh, I'm going to try and create something similar, but like I said, it might be too slow or whatever, but we'll see how far we get. Uh, in any case, uh, even if we don't get there, uh, or if you do, I'll try to show you the full process and uh, I can open some of these files as well. Uh, that might not be a bad thing either. So um, yeah, let's just dive in, shall we? So basically, um, the way these are set up is all of these meshes are photo scans, which I've mapped over onto another mesh. Um, so we'll start with the photo scan part, kind of go through that a little bit, and then um, move on to the meshing and everything in Blender afterwards. So uh, I went out about an hour ago uh, to take photographs of some trees uh, in front of my house here. I have no idea how well this is going to work, so I'm going in blind, so we'll just see. And we'll have some try and have some fun uh, while we're doing it. It's a little darker in here than I would have liked as well, but hey, it is what it is. So you can see a bunch of pictures of a tree. I shot them really quick, which means some of them aren't even properly in focus. So the first thing I'm going to do is filter those out uh, just so I can make sure I have uh, all the decent ones that I need in here. So. Let's see, this first one, it's not perfect, but it's doable. Uh, that one kind of sucks. That's the same one. Okay, so I usually filter out the ones that aren't that great. So these are already bad. Let's delete them. This one isn't great either. So there's going to be some I guess boring bits um, yeah during the stream because I'll be kind of working and, and concentrating as well sometimes uh, we'll have to wait for the scans as well so if you have questions you can start uh, typing them out and thinking of them and I can go through them um, so this one unfortunately also sucks and I deleted the wrong one I think that's okay it's not the worst thing ever Did I? Yeah, I did. So that's that one. There we go. That's okay, that's okay, that's okay. They're not super sharp, so I don't know how good the result is gonna be. Uh, I would delete this one. And again, I shot them on my phone, so it was more just to illustrate that you can do it as well. Um, Let's see, 33 is pretty bad. Yeah, they're not great. Oof, I don't know what those are gonna do. I'm gonna throw that one out. So I usually do a bit of a selection, uh, like I said, just to get the ones out that are really terrible and really unfocused. So um, for the images that I was showing, the, the first one I shot with my phone and the other two I went back with my camera because I found like a cool tree. Um, and I wanted to see if I could do something with it. There's some finger in here because um, the sun was shining and I was trying to like make a matte box with my hand kind of. Um, so let's see, which one is this? 20. So that one can go. So yeah, went out to go uh, look like a crazy person in public taking pictures of trees. It's really all we can do. Uh, and I'm lucky that there's some trees in front of me here. Actually, let's go back into that. I closed it, didn't I? So, scans the third one. And I'm using uh, Metashape for this, but you could also, if you wanted to, use Meshroom, which is open source and free. Um, I'm just used to Metashape and I, I kind of know what the settings are so I can quickly work. Um, but you could do the same thing with Metashape, export a mesh and a texture from it from some pictures that you took. Again, I wouldn't say these are ideal, but let's start anyway. So I'll align the photos and I'm going to set the accuracy at the start to high. 
And this bit might take a little while. There might be some hitching here and there while the computer is trying to process stuff. So <clears throat> we'll see how well it goes. So. Now would be a good time for questions. Any questions? It's all good. Come on, you can do it. <clears throat> there we go. So we've got the first bit of our scan that seems to look okay. There's some sunlight in here, which I wouldn't necessarily want. And there's a whole lot of background in there, which I don't need either. So um, first I'm gonna optimize my cameras. So they're a little bit better. This just helps with the scan generally I've found. <clears throat> And then I'm going to try and get just the bit that I need. So let's see, let's resize this to just have that. And again, I don't know what the scan is going to look like. It might be horrible. So you never know. But it's worth a try to do this live. I'm going to grab these white ones here because we don't need them. Just delete them. So now we've got our scan set up just uh, to process this part. Um, all of these extra dots we don't need, but they're outside of the boundary, so it's not going to consider them. You can kind of see how it's trying to do the background, which is kind of funny as well. Um, I know there's apps out there for photo scanning as well on your phone. Um, I haven't used them yet, but... Uh, yeah, they seem pretty decent as well. So I'm gonna leave the quality to medium, otherwise it's gonna take forever. Okay, let's see if I can answer some questions. Um, ah, I'm sure there's plenty of YouTubers live now. <laughs> I sort of decided this last minute, so I didn't I didn't really give people a lot of um, a lot of notice, I guess. Uh, why do I use Ubuntu? Um, I just like it. Um, oof, this is not a great scan. Um, I don't know. It works for me. I, I like using it. Um, I like the whole open source thing. It's different for everybody, obviously. So I'm going to try and delete some of this stuff that we don't need. I can already see the scans pretty rough, so it might not be the best one to move forward with, but that's okay. We can try others while we're trying out this one in Blender. We can have the others process. It's kind of the whole point of the stream anyway, so. Grab a whole bunch of points here that I don't need. Throw them out. So I'm pretty unforgiving with this stuff. I try to keep only the stuff that works really well. You'll see there's a lot of holes here, so we'll get a bit of a weird mesh. Even if it doesn't turn out perfect or I don't end up liking the image, at least you've seen the, the full process. So. Let's see. I would also suggest maybe grabbing a beverage and some music or something uh, that will help as well. Let's delete. Let's grab some of this stuff as well, delete that. Uh, somebody was asking me what uh, app I'm using. So this is called Metashape. Um, it's by an, a developer called Agisoft, A-G-I-S-O-F-T. Uh, and the application is called Metashape. But you could do this in Meshroom as well, which is free and open source. So you could try it um, and try it yourself. Meshroom is pretty cool. It works quite well. We'll see. Not all of this is going to be useful. I think I might throw out some of this as well because it's just not very connected to the rest. There we go. Normally I take way more pictures and from all angles and that kind of thing, but yeah. Let's see, is there anything floating? No? All right. Let's move on. Let's build the mesh. Um, I don't know what the face count is going to be like. Let's set the quality to high and the face count to medium and see what that does. 
Um, is there a way to have better accuracy using pictures of multiple angles of the same tree? Yeah. So um, it's really a case of practicing. You want to sort of take pictures of the same part from different angles, different um, different heights. Uh, really, the more pictures you take, the higher uh, the quality is, and it just get, takes some getting used to. So. What am I planning to do with this mesh? Ha! Ah, that's a secret. <laughs> no, I'm not gonna explain the whole process now. I think it's more fun if we we kind of just walk through it a little bit. Um, the idea is to deform it, uh, to bring it into Blender and mess with it, so we can wrap it around something else. Come on. And this stuff tends to take a while, so. Yay, look at the progress bars. Everybody's favorite Saturday night. <laughs> Come on. Uh, the software is Agisoft Metashape. Um, but yeah, actually, while this is doing, I could just open Firefox and maybe show something here. Do I have a Firefox open? There we go. Um, so this is the software that I use. Uh, and it's made for all kinds of photo scanning. But the free alternative that you could use is called Meshroom. There we go. And it basically does the same thing, but for free. Um, I just, yeah, here you can see 3D models and stuff as well. I'm just used to Metashape. I've been using it for years now. Um, and I, I bought a license way back in the day and it's still, they still give me updates. So I, I keep using it because I'm used to it. But um, results are comparable. I think Metashape is able to just get just a little bit more out of the same images. <clears throat> but at the same time, um, Meshroom is pretty decent too. So and like I said, we're doing this with, um, what was I going to say, with... Uh, mobile phone picture, so we're not really giving it a great input to begin with. But we do have a somewhat decent mesh, 650,000 vertices, that's all right, we could work with that. That might be, might be cool. So the last part of this step is to build the texture. I'm gonna build an 8K texture just to keep things moving along, but generally I'll build either a 16 or a 32K texture um, just to get the maximum amount of, uh, of resolution out of it. You can see even just with a phone, like I did this in, I don't know, um, uh, what, maybe a few minutes, if even. I just stood in front of the tree and just went like this, up and down, up and down a couple of times. Um, and even with that, you get a fairly decent result. So did they rename Photoscan to Meta Shape? Yes, they did. It used to be called Photoscan and now it's called Meta Shape. I don't know why they did that, but Oh well, it's up to them, I guess. So now we can get a, a preview with a text model. Now you can see, even though the mesh isn't super um, isn't super detailed, you get quite a bit of detail back from that texture. Now we've got an 8K texture, and you'll see in a minute that these textures are sort of weird. So I might just uh, upgrade this to a 16K texture, but first I'm gonna save everything and let that run in the background. So let's see. Um, Got to go to projects. Where's thread here? There we go. Scans, and this is tree three. And I'm going to export 
the model as well. There we go. It's going to ask me what I want to export the texture as. I'm just going to use a JPEG, like I said, just to keep things a little bit quicker. And then we'll move into Blender in a second. Uh, one of the things I am going to do is let this run in the background to rebuild the text. But uh, I wanted to keep the UVs and just build it at a higher resolution. There we go. And we can uh, move over to Blender now, start the work. There we go. I'm just gonna throw the interface size up a little bit so everybody can see it a little bit better. All right, so let's start by importing our OBJ file. All right, so and this is where things uh, might slow down every now and then, but it's okay. So first thing I'm gonna do is actually try and align this somewhat in each view. There we go, Let's see, rotate a little bit like this. Now you'll see why this is important in just a second. So it looks like it's fairly straight. I mean, the trees, obviously, it's going to be kind of a weird shape. Now let's put this in the middle as well. All right, there we go. So this is our shape. If we go into the material preview, it imported it with the texture. So we can actually see the tree with the texture. Now, not all of this mesh is useful, but I'll clean that up in a little bit. And then we can see the resolution isn't great, but that's why I'm building it in the background again, so I can swap out the texture later. Because um, the UVs will stay the same uh, within MetaShape. Now, something I'm going to need to do is to get flatten this out to begin with. So let's start with that. Um, and I'm looking at it from the side here. So what I'll do is I'll create a plane, scale it out, I'm going to do this in solid view. Sort of the length of this is a, you kind of try to like figure it out a little bit. Um, it'll become clear in just a second what I'm doing. So let's maybe do 15 cuts. And the idea is that this plane, I'll, able, I'll be able to sort of bend it around and have it fit the shape of the tree a little bit and then bend it back out and have the tree come out with it. So we'll see how well that works. It's a little bit of guesswork, but yeah. Actually, let's try this, move this up. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to add a shape key. So now this is going to be the basis. And let me put that at about two here. And now I'm going to add in a new shape key. And any changes to the mesh that I make here will actually um, only propagate to this key. And that's the, the trick to making this work. So I believe there's something called warp, which I haven't tried before. Oh, there we go. That actually works quite well. So what warp is going to do, it's going to grab your object and warp it around the um, warp it around the 3D cursor. So because it's in the middle, it's actually just going to create a cylinder out of it. But this is what we want because now um, I have a shape key that does this, which means if I just grab this mesh, I'm going to do this very quick and dirty now, but and I add in a surface to form. What this is going to do is it's going to grab the, this mesh is a base and have that one move along with it. So let's grab this plane over here and bind it. That's the important step. And now if I go back to the plane and I move my shape key, 
it'll actually stretch out with it. So you get sort of a flattened plane. Um, generally, this is used for like blend shapes for faces, but you can use it for this kind of thing as well. And you can see it works quite well. So you don't have to do any rigging or anything. You can just use the plane, but this isn't perfect. I want to refine this a little bit more to get, the, to get it to the best shape we possibly can. So I'm going to go back to the mesh and unbind this. And actually I can leave that on, but now it's not bound. So it's not really going to affect anything. And what I'm going to do is just add in a couple of extra loop cuts. So maybe seven or so, something like that. I don't want to give myself too much work either, but, um, what we can now do is use the snapping system and we can snap to the face. And now to get this a little bit better, um, I'm just going to select this vertex down here, hit G and then have it snap to the mesh. So now we're snapping our deformed mesh onto the final mesh. And that will give us a slightly better result because it's going to follow the shape of the mesh a little bit better. And every time I'm snapping this, I'm sort of trying to get it at a good level where it's sort of in between all the pokey bits. Now the other meshes I was using for this before weren't as extreme when it came to like height difference, um, but we can mess with that later a little bit as well. But now it's just a case of going in here, snapping these all on, and you could see like the edges before they were really they're really pushed out. So let's see uh, if we can just move this out a little bit. We want these bottom ones just to be, oh, it's the y axis, just to be moved out a bit so they don't completely deform the thing like crazy. And we'll do this row first. And this might seem like boring, busy work, but it really does help with the final shape I've found. So, and you can see that in the images as well. If you look at the first one, it's a lot rougher than the other ones. And like the, the last one, I, I figured all of this stuff out where I was snapping it to the mesh to make it look a little bit better. And it really did help quite a bit. So And it'll get a little bit wonky if you deform it too much, but that's kind of part of the fun, I think. It doesn't have to be perfect. Now in relation to this, this is going to push it in a little bit just because these are out here. So what I might do is just grab these, push them out a little bit on the Y axis. There we go. And it's all about just getting the shape. Let's see. I'm sure there's some questions. Anyway, you could enable keyboard, key display, so we can see what you're pressing. Yes, there actually is. Uh, I'm sorry, I completely forgot about that. I wonder if screencast keys is enabled here. It is not. I know I downloaded it recently, but I'd have to go find it. Did I put it in here? No. Okay. Let's grab it real quick. Uh, there it is. Did you open it? Dump it in there. Screencast keys, there we go. And it did not work for some reason. Nope. I was using it the other day, so it's weird that it doesn't work. Maybe because it's read only. Nope, doesn't feel like it. Oh man. Let's see, maybe something went wrong. Let's see if I can throw them out real quick.
Ah, looks like these. Yeah, so there's an installer here, and that's what the problem seemed to be. Um, preferences. There we go, screencast keys. Nope. There we go. You can kind of see what I'm doing. It's better. Where were we? Back to this. Quickly have a look at some of the things. I could use the shrink wrap modifier. Yeah, but it the problem with the shrink wrap modifier is that it doesn't actually project the mesh um, to one place. It's always trying to shrink wrap it back down to the um, to the origin. So it's going to pull in some of those vertices, which is why I do it manually. Um, because in this case, it doesn't exactly do what I need it to do. So, But it is a good idea. Um, on planar stuff, it might work a little bit better. But like this, it's a bit rough, I think. So let's see. That's on there. This might seem a little bit excessive, but we'll see. Hopefully it'll give us a better, uh, better result. Let's see. Check multiple points at once, is it? Ah, I didn't know that. Cool. Today I learned. Let's see if that works. Thank you for the tip. Ah, oh, that works really well. Awesome. Thank you. See, is there an easy way to look at this? Oh, something weird happened there. That's okay, we can fix that. So I don't think I need any of these to project. Well, maybe that one. Let's see how well that worked. Nah, it's freaking out a little bit. I guess I can do two or three at a time that are close to each other. But still. Good to know. Got the right one? No, it's this one I need. Fix that a little bit. Um, that one's looking all right. More of these, I guess. So which ones did I do? I'm starting to lose track. They all seem like they're snapped. there how much of a mesh is there here there we go like these outliers I guess I'll snap this one here and maybe snap this one here I'll see but there I already 
saw in the uh, in the shape itself that they're not the most useful bits so we're gonna have to cut those out anyway but it works a little bit easier when it's flat Sort it out. Come on, you can do it. So sometimes I'll move it just a little bit so you get a good sort of averaging out in the mesh. There we go. So it just fits a little bit better. And I wish I could stream music, but with all the copyright stuff, I don't wanna don't wanna try it, unfortunately. Um, move that in just a little bit. Let's see what that does. So let's go back. Uh, and because this is all still set up, all we need to do is hit bind. And now with this one set, go back. That's starting to look a little bit better. You can see how it's flattened out quite a bit. The edges still stick out, but we'll throw those out. But all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a copy of this. Oop. I moved it around apparently. Uh, and I'm gonna apply the modifier, unbind this and turn it off just to keep everything running a little bit smoother. So now we've got a mesh that we can start using for things. Now, unfortunately, um, I'm gonna to have to be pretty aggressive in what I delete here because I can see, yeah, a lot of this stuff isn't quite useful. So I'm just gonna go in a top view and anywhere where the, the polygons are like quite big and stretched, sort of throw those out. So let's lasso some of this stuff out. And I just wanna end up with a patch that's somewhat useful. Something like this maybe. It's okay if it's kind of a weird shape, it's not the worst. There we go. Uh, maybe take some of this stuff out. There we go. Invert it, delete the vertices. Uh, and now it's just a case of making sure I've got no strays here because they're not gonna, that could be kind of annoying. And now I just want to check to, sh to make sure that in the material, there's nothing that's too weird of a different color. So you can see there's some green over on the left here and over on the right. Um, so let's take those out as well. I'm going into wireframe mode each time so I can actually select all of the vertices at once. Let's just take out this bit as well because it's not going to be that useful. There we go, so over here, so let's just do something like this. Cool. There we go, that looks kind of cool. Looks useful. Let's go have a look at uh, Metashape, see what that's done. So we can see the texture is a little bit higher quality. It's still not perfect, but it'll do for now. I'll, leave, I'll save this and leave it open, or actually I'll close it. If we do end up needing it, then uh, I'll grab it again. But it's just about showing how everything works. So now we've got this. Now first thing I'm gonna do here is just make sure this is aligned. It just makes your life a lot easier when you know all of this stuff is somewhat in the middle. Cool, so uh, let's see. Uh, there we go. I'm just looking at the questions there. I'll answer them in a second. Just want to keep going here. So yeah, we've got some nice crazy curly mesh here, which is fun. So the next step is uh, I'm going to import a mesh that I've been using for this. And I found this on 
the polycount form. So I'm not gonna take any credit for this. I'm gonna show you in a second where you can find it as well. Um, let's see, yeah. Grab all of these polygons here. Oh, there we go. We don't need the bottom, so we're gonna throw them out. Um, and let me just show you where I found that. So on the polycount wiki, there's a base mesh bust.obj file, which you can just download and use. Um, yeah, it's just there to start, you know, sculpting or whatever. But because it's all closed up, we're not going to have any issues with the, um, what was I going to say? We're not going to have any issues with the surface to form because it doesn't like holes and stuff in the mesh. So if I was going to start using one of those meshes from MB Lab, um, it's going to be a bit of a nightmare because you have to close it up and clean it up. And this works well enough. So um, let's make it a little bit smaller. And now we've got to look for a good way to slice this up. So I'm going to unwrap this first and you'll see why in a minute. This is sort of where the, the secret sauce comes in, I guess. So this already has an unwrap, but um, there's going to be a lot of stretching here. So what I want to do is unwrap it in places where we can sort of hide the seams a little bit. So around the face here. Uh, and actually, oh, let's have it go down here and there. There we go. I'll mark a seam. We're going to unwrap it down the middle as well. Mark a seam. There we go. And now if we unwrap it, let's have a look. So this looks like it's going to be a lot less stretched out, which is good because that's what we want. So now the trick is in generating a shape key from those UVs. So there's, uh, you, I know you can do something similar with the tissue add-on, but um, I use a tool called Wrapping Tools, and I'll show you where I found that as well. Um, Blender Wrapping Tools, <clears throat> a wrap tool. So you can either um, buy it on the Blender market to uh, support him, or you can download it for free from his GitHub page as well. So um, if you do end up using a lot, obviously support the uh, the creator. Now the cool thing is basically what it does is it gives you a shape key that's a flat version of your UVs. So uh, I could just download it, but I've already got it installed. So in my case, what I want to do is create UV shape is going to be um, the thing that triggers it. Now, first thing I want to do is select those seams again. Uh, there we go. There we go. And select all of this. Um, I'm going to edge split them. Now, I want to just add in a subsurf, and actually I shouldn't have edged with them. It's okay, we can add in a weld here first. Let's bring it back, and I'm going to subsurf it twice. Yeah, and convert it to a mesh. Go back in, and then I'm going to edge split these. And this will allow it to kind of flop open, and you'll see that in a second. Mm. Edge split, totally missing it here. Okay, let's just do it the easy way. Edge split, there we go. So now I'm gonna tell it, use the active UV map. So that's the one that I just created. And um, I'm gonna say, turn off rescale islands, and I'm gonna say, create UV shape. And nothing seems to happen, but now basically what has happened, it's created a shape key of that UV shape, which is kind of cool. Now I'm going to go into that shape key and tweak it a little bit, uh, just to make it easier on myself again. Let's see. And you kind of have to look at how it flips. So that's that side of the face, and that's the other side of the face. So I want the two sides of the head kind of together. But I'm um, going to turn off snapping. Let's 
scale this down, put this in the middle, put the sides of the face here, and the sides or the, the rest of the bust over there. Let's see. It's the best way to flip this. And it might not work out, I might have to redo this or change the UV again. Actually, I want to scale them all up together so they stay relatively the same size. I'm going to look at my mesh here. Yeah, something like this is probably a little bit easier to work with. So that's one side of the face. Oh. That's another side of the face. Let's do it like this. And then I'm going to figure out how those busts are angled. I think this would be the bottom of that side, maybe. Uh, let's see. Something like that. That could work. All right. So how to actually get this to work now? Um, actually, one more thing. I'm going to set these down to zero so I know uh, and I'm going to have to apply all the transforms. Set this down to zero. There we go. So now it's just a case of kind of mapping this to the side of that face. And I'm going to duplicate this one first and hide it just so we have that mesh to start from every single time. And I do this with the material preview on so I can kind of match some parts of it uh, to other parts of it. Let me scale this up a little bit. And I'm just trying to fill up that entire area. And what I could do is grab some of this stuff. Nope. There we go. Hit Y to separate it. And then move that over here, maybe. And it's not the worst thing ever if it overlaps. Let's look at the material preview, not the render, the material preview. Oh, this is going to take forever. Yeah, there's a reason for this, but I won't go into it. Um, see if there's any other questions. How was it when you got invited to Blender Live? Must have been nice. Yeah, it was cool. Um, so I've worked with the Blender Institute a fair bit in the past. I've done training for them and stuff. So I know the guys a little bit, um, but it was nice getting invited. It was cool. Uh, I've been watching some of the everyday streams as well. It was fun to be able to contribute. Um, yeah, it, it helps. <laughs> it's cool to keep people, uh, keep people entertained as well in these strange times. So I'm glad I could contribute to that. No, it's not a case of saved or not. It's this loading render kernels. It just happens the first time around when I've compiled Blender. So something might have changed and then it has to just do it one time. Um, but I hadn't done it before the stream yet. I had recompiled Blender, but I hadn't rendered yet. So it's going to take a minute or two. That's all. Um, yeah. Come on. Well, at least that's done for when we start rendering. I guess that's something. Come on, you can do it. <laughs> yeah, those wrap tools, they're basically, uh, let's see if we can look at the video. Uh, I'm gonna turn off the sound, even though I don't think you guys can hear it, but here it kind of goes to show what it does at the very beginning. As you can see there's a shape there and then it just wraps around again. It's pretty cool. You can use it for all kinds of stuff, uh, for all kinds of modeling. I can't remember how I found it, but yeah. Let's start saving this. Um, 
where are we? Projects thread thread four. And actually, I'm going to take a take a little bit of a shortcut on this one just to save on time. Um, we'll see how good it looks. There we go. And I'm going to go to my undo history and keep this as one shape. There we go, and just kind of scale it up a little bit to map it over. Um, and then duplicate it, grab this one. So we know if you turn off this shape that um, sort of the light part of the mesh here, and generally when I'll do photo scans, I'll try and get the lighting out, uh, is also mapped sort of on, on the front of the face. So I might scale this negative one over the x-axis just so I could get a similar sort of look around that part of the face. So let's match that one here. And then duplicate it again. And I guess we could try something weird here. It's gonna be in a different direction, but you never know. Uh, and maybe do the same over here. But just flip it. You can reuse the same asset a couple of times, it's, the, it's okay. Um, all right, so let's turn all these off and start with the first one. And now all I want to do is, and unfortunately it's not super visible, uh, there we go, is just trim off any of the excess. So let's see if we can create a shape that sort of goes around here. Make sure we have everything. I don't know how visible it's going to be on the stream. I just want to make sure of the edges of this underlying mesh here. You and I'm straining to see it, but I think that should work. I'm going to throw out everything else. And that's why I made a copy of the original mesh first. So if I ever need to change anything, I can just go back. There we go. Uh, maybe something like this. Nope. Straining to see the edge here. Sometimes zooming out helps a little bit. And you don't have to be super precise with this stuff. There was one where I was cutting it out like perfectly to the edges of it and it really didn't make that much of a difference. We can always tweak it a little bit after. There we go. Maybe that little bit that sticks out. Cut off just a little bit extra here. Nope, I want the vertices. There we go. And this is somewhat re repetitive, unfortunately, but it is what it is. I wish there was a better way to visualize this, but unfortunately there isn't. Uh, or not one that I immediately know of. like this, maybe like that. I just want to get rid of all the excess here. I tried it, I was doing it before with a boolean where I would um, add a solidify, a solidify modifier to this mesh and then boolean the different shapes. But because it's such a weird mesh, it just did not work out. So if you're screaming at the screens going, hey, just use a boolean, um, tried it, didn't really work out, unfortunately. like that there we go and throw that out and there's going to be some weird deformation because i didn't really spend all that much time on the uv to try and find an optimized piece obviously the more pieces you do this with the more work you have i've generally found that between for this like base mesh at least that i found uh, between no nope, not edges but vertices there we go between four and six pieces kind of solves the uh, the stretching problem. So with those four now, we've got an interesting set of meshes. Now it's just a case of getting them to kind of align a little bit. Nope. There we go. Something like this, so they kind of overlap. And I'm going to apply the scale as well, because I scaled some of them in object mode. Um, so let's see. 
we can either bring them all together, which is what I'm going to do. Actually, no, I'm going to duplicate them first and then join them. So I keep a lot of the original meshes just uh, in case I need to go a step back so you don't have to like undo what you're doing. Is that a piece of mesh or is that? I'm going to throw that stuff out. There we go. Okay, and then it's just the same again with the surface to form modifier. And we're going to set it to the base mesh. I'm going to bind this. And then when we go into the base mesh and set the UV shape key back down to zero, it's bounded around the person. So just turn this off for a second. This is way out there, which in itself is incredibly cool. I really like this effect, but you can see it's just a little bit too much to get something uh, that reads as a human shape from it. So what we might do, set this back to one, grab the shape and then scale it on the Z axis to maybe like 0.5. So we'd still retain some of that weirdness, but not quite as much. And then when we redo it, so I'm going to unbind it for a second and bind it again. And you can see this has controls for a vertex group as well. Um, so you could do pretty much anything, any kind of funky effects with it. Um, actually, I need to set that base mesh back to zero. There we go. And now it's a little out there. Like I said, I had no idea what to expect from this result, but I like it nonetheless. We can even trim some of this. So again, I'm going to grab that mesh. Eh, maybe it's still a little bit too much. So set this back to one. Turn this back on. And scale it down even more. So there's obviously a lot of stretching happening. Um, so sometimes you got to get it kind of weird. You can see how non-stretched this is. So I'm gonna, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna apply the scale, unbind it, bind it. Maybe I overdid it now. I think I forgot to apply the scale on the previous step. There we go. That looks sort of interesting. You can see it sort of sticks through here. We can fix that in a little bit. Um, I want a little bit more of that texture back. I'm getting picky about it, but hey, what are you going to do about it? Um, so let's go back, turn on that base mesh. We're going to first unbind this, scale it back up a little bit in the z-axis. Maybe something like that. Let's not forget to apply the scale this time. I think that's what happened last time. There we go. Maybe a little bit more. You'll see I'll have to go back and redo it now, but I ah, will. Let's apply the scale. Bind. But once you've got it set up, you can see you can play around with it as much as you want. There we go. I, I kind of like the look of that. That looks creepy enough. So now let's look at the material preview and you can see now that I aligned that stuff, you can get really interesting variation within the material as well, which is really fun. Um, <clears throat> only thing I'm going to do, again, I'm going to duplicate this and I'm going to apply the modifier so it's not constantly having to calculate. And in this one, I'm going to unbind it and turn it off as well just to keep things flowing a little bit better. Now I can either clean this bit up over here where it sticks together, or I can just render it from the other side. So um, it's up to me. I might try to push this in just a little bit. Let's see, I'm gonna set this to connected and turn on. So that way it's only gonna grab that part of the mesh. This might be a little bit too much. Here we go, we can still fix it. That didn't work out quite as the way, quite as how I thought it would. 
So there's a bit over here we can bring out. I'm gonna make this a little bit smaller. And bring this in. I'm just selecting one vertex and pushing it in and out. It's a little bit slow because the mesh is quite heavy, but there we go. It's kind of a weird looking nose. I don't mind that. Maybe bring it in just a little bit more. Looks like that really messed it up. Let's actually bring in the outside here. That might work a little bit better. Grab this as well, bring it in just a little bit too. There we go. That looks like it might work. Let's go back to the material preview. That looks really funky. Really like the way that bark sort of protrudes everywhere. Now, because we use the same bit of the mesh on most places, it looks a little bit symmetrized, um, but that doesn't really take away from it, I think. So this could look cool. All right, so we can move on to shading. Now, um, let's see if there's any more questions. Is it only Blender I prefer? I don't know, I just, yeah, I've been using it for a number of years now, I just like it. There's nothing wrong with other applications. Um, I'll, every now and then I'll use Houdini if I need something really specific, but that's rare occasions. Um, yeah. Needs the escape key to pros stop all and any process is dead. Um, yeah, the, I think that's a Houdini thing as well, right? Um, it works for any action that you're doing that you're in the middle of, but I don't know. I usually kind of know what I'm, what I'm doing anyway, so. Um, doing lots of work to the trunk. Am I gonna replace it later when I get a better scan or is it just the texture? I'm just getting a higher resolution texture. Um, generally, I would start with a slightly higher resolution scan, but then everything gets a little bit slow and I thought for the stream, I would uh, I would kind of keep it a little bit uh, more low res than I normally would, so. Um, what is the most weakness you see in Blender as a motion graphics artist and wait for improvements in it? <laughs> I don't know. I don't like to think in terms of weakness or strengths. Um, obviously, every application has its own weaknesses and strengths. Um, I'm mostly waiting for everything nodes because I think that will allow similar workflows to um, like Cinema 4D stuff. So, but uh, in general, um, yeah, that kind of thing. I guess the everything nodes is going to solve a lot. It's going to allow you to use nodes for the modifiers and for particles, which I think is really valuable and will change a lot of the workflow for the better. So I guess I'm, I'm kind of waiting for that. Uh, so somebody asks, is there any way in Blender to texture paint in stencil mode and paint all the loaded PBR textures at once? Uh, I think there is like a complicated way to do it with nodes but I'm not 100% sure. I've almost never texture paint in Blender. So unfortunately, I think it might be the wrong guy to ask. So love the back of the collar. Yeah, that's looking pretty red. I like that as well. Um, but yeah, you, I mean, you could still flip those meshes around and use them separately. Um, why don't you use knife project? That was very true. I should have knife projected that. I completely forgot about it. Um, now, one of the reasons knife project might not work as well is because you are projecting the actual edge of that onto the mesh, which means you have nothing extra, so there's zero overlap. And sometimes having that little bit of overlap helps to kind of blend the meshes together, but um, it could be a very good alternative, so. Okay, let's start with uh, with shading. I'll answer the rest of the questions later. So yeah, I guess let's just get into it. I need to make sure that I'm not using my display GPU. No, okay, there we go. Um, so the shading's already kind of done, which is fun. Um, I'm gonna do this in black and white again, just because I really like uh, working in black and white. I might just bring this down a little bit. Oh. So we've got a bit more space to work with, because really we only have one object. Uh, and then we could put a rendered view here as well. 
So let's start with a good camera angle. Let's try and figure out a cool kind of angle for the portrait. I want to get that brighter part in there because it like looks kind of interesting. I think, yeah, this side is definitely the more interesting side of the two because it's got a bit of a better silhouette. So let's go for something like this. It's a bit similar to the other images, but that's not the worst. Um, you can always mess with the camera later. And of course, I need to set something here. So let's just move this over for a second. And the reason I'm not closing them is because I don't want to have to re redo them later. So 2048 by 2560. There we go. Let's put that guy over here. And maybe I'll leave this open just so I can mess with the camera settings. So I want to turn on the Passport 2 so I can't see anything. There we go. And let's uh, set it to rendered. Turn off our overlays. All right. So first of all, let's start with the camera here. Do a little bit more work. Bring it back. Get it to look sort of in an interesting place. Like this, maybe. Let's start with our first light. So I tend to use mainly area lights, uh, just because they give you a nice um, fall off. But, and here I'll pull this open a little bit more so we've got a bit more space to work with. Um, sometimes I'll try sunlights as well, because they give these really nice, harsh shadows and you can do some really cool stuff if you've got an intricate mesh like this. So here you can immediately see the difference. Um, and did I close Metashape? It did, didn't I? I might bring in that texture later, but we'll see. But here you can see um, it's parallel lighting. So you can do, you can get some really nice uh, silhouettes and things out of it. And I kind of liked what it was doing. So we already have something that looks quite nice here. And I'm gonna go into the, Go into the material settings here real quick. Let's add in a hue and saturation, and let's just desaturate the whole thing because I want to do black and white. <clears throat> so generally when I'm doing black and white images, I'll actually do everything in black and white in the shading as well. I'm not going to desaturate it after the fact, um, just so I have a bit more to work with. Now we'll see, let's add in another light here, but we'll do an area light for this one. Um, usually I'll start lighting sort of the sides rather than really doing one um, all the way from the front. Um, you'll see the lighting setups are gonna be pretty similar. I can show the other files a little bit later on as well. I'm gonna change one thing just so we can see it work a little bit better. And also because 420, meme, whatever. There we go. So I just want to be able to see what I'm doing here. That looks all right. All right, so let's start messing with the uh, the other side here as well. Um, this looks kind of nice because it kind of accents that little bit of shape we have over here but it doesn't necessarily take out um, sort of the main light here. Might add a little bit more to that. There we go, maybe just even a little bit more. There we go, so now we've got a nice highlight. Bring it down just a touch. Let's see if we can bring it out. That helps. There we go. And now I wanna add in the volumetrics, of course, because um, that would be awesome. Volumetrics are always cool. Now, if I'm gonna just add them into the world view, so let's throw, say I throw in a principal volume shader in here, um, what's gonna happen is because the sunlight is sort of an infinite light, um, it's not really gonna do anything because the thing with volumetrics in the world shader, let's say if you're using an HDRI or a sunlight, because it's coming from infinitely far, it just gets filtered out. So it doesn't actually work. 
Um, so if you're using just area lights, you can use it in the world view, but we're gonna have to do a bit of a custom setup to get it to work with the sunlight. So I'm gonna do, um, I'm gonna create a cube and I did the same thing on the uh, live stream here as well. I'm gonna create a cube so I can have a circle. So it's gonna add a bunch of subdivisions to it and a cast modifier set to one just so I have a circle here. And I'm gonna make it a little bit bigger so it maybe just ends right before the camera. And we're gonna give this a, um, a volume shader instead. So that way the light coming from the sun will actually work with it. And you'll see the, the, um, the difference in just a second. So visibility, not visibility, but viewport display, I'm gonna set this to bounds. There we go. And generally what I'll do in my outline as well is just set it to non-selectable. That way I have to select it in the outline and actually change it. So with this selected, I'm gonna add a new uh, shader to it, delete the principled and add in a principled volume. And it's not working correctly for some reason. Interesting. I wonder if that's down to something I'm doing or my build. Okay, let me just try something here because it might be down to my build of Blender. which isn't the other one then starting. Okay, um, disregard that. That's an issue because of the way I'm, I'm working here. It has nothing to do with Blender. I wonder though, that is odd. Okay, so we'll just fix it. We'll do this with an area light and then we can just use it in the, uh, in the world slot. Sometimes I'll encounter stuff like this because of that build that I'm using. So I'm gonna change the shape a little bit so the shadows get a little bit harsher. So it looks a little bit more like that sunlight we were using. Maybe have it come up from the top a little bit more. Actually, that's kind of cool. There we go. I just wanna highlight those little edges a little bit. You can see the way they, they sort of show up and the extra detail shows up. Um, a bit more power in there. There we go. Maybe add just a little bit more to this one as well. Now we've got a nice contrasty image. Let's mess with the contrast here as well. And let's add in the volume. Bring down the density. There we go. And now the, we still need to do some tweaking of the lights because, for example, here in the back, um, I'm getting this giant halo over here, which I don't necessarily want. So in the um, visibility settings, I can turn it off for the volume scatter. And now it will actually give some of that. Uh, it's still, it'll still give that lighting up over here. And for this one, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move it back on its own axis. So the point of the light sort of stays the same, but the um, the transmission here isn't quite as crazy. I'll have to crank up the light a little bit, but at least it'll be coming from a more general direction. It looks a little bit smoother. There we go. What you could do even is duplicate this light if you still want to get a little bit of that uh, sense and then swap these around. So turn everything else off and turn on the volume scatter and then just bring that down just so you still have a hint of that going on here. And then I could possibly bring it up so it just feels a little bit more distributed. There we go. So you can shape like the, the way the, the volume metrics are shaped doesn't necessarily need to match the lights to make it look cool. 
Let's go back to my camera here, and I'll answer some questions in a second. I like this. Uh, like to kind of get stuck into this process a little bit. Maybe move it in just a little bit more. And one thing we're still missing is depth of field. So I'm just going to shift right click around where the eyes would be to place the 3D cursor there. And then I'm going to add in an empty. And then in my camera settings, I'm going to grab that empty. And now we got to just mess with the f-stop. Let's overdo it and then bring it back a little bit. There we go. Actually, let's go back here and then mess with the blades. Oh, not 133, but 133. So that way we've got a slightly more interesting looking depth of field. Now I haven't done much with the shading yet. So let me make this a little bit bigger so it's a bit more visible. And you can see these scenes aren't necessarily composed of a lot of stuff. Now, what's working against us here is the uh, the size of the texture. So I'm going to go back in to MetaShape and see if we bring in we can bring in that 16K texture instead. I don't know how much it will help, but it might just a little bit. So let's re-export the texture. And it was in thread for import. And let's call this HI for high res. Diffuse map, that's fine. And normally they should match, so see if I bring in the high res there we go you can see it a little bit but it's still not perfect so generally what I'll do is just a very quick and dirty bump map from that same texture let's see uh, this will help a lot though so if we throw this into the normal now you can kind of see the difference so if we go in a little bit closer sure from close you can see that it's like a crazy bump map and it's a little bit over the top but for these kind of purposes, it works. So I might bring this in a little bit. Or just overdo it. We can shade smooth as well to see if that helps. Let's overdo it. It's art, doesn't matter. Generally, I wouldn't really use a, a bump map this extreme for anything realistic, but it just helps catch those extra little bits of detail. So, um, I guess one more thing that's left to do is the particle system and the compositing is fairly light on these as well. So um, let's do the particle system first. I'm going to turn this off for a second and go full screen. So first of all, I'm going to create a cube to hold all my particles and I'm going to reset the, uh, the 3D cursor as well. There we go. So generally, I'll try to like orient it a little bit to the camera. There we go, that should do for particles. And now the fun trick uh, with these particles is I do want them to look slightly differently. Now, this is a detail that probably won't show up, but I'm gonna do it anyway, uh, just because it's fun. So I'm gonna set this to material preview. And let's build a shader for this. Let's grab a gradient texture. There we go. And all I'm doing is I'm just having it use the UV coordinates instead of the generated ones, so I know it's going to work on all of them. Throw in a color ramp and bring in the dark here there we go so uh, i want to mix this in but what i also want to do is distort this a little bit so it looks a little bit more like a dust mode um so i'm going to grab another texture here a noise texture 
and I'm going to distort the vector of this gradient with the noise texture. So let's have a look at it first. That looks all right, but we can mess with it later. So this, uh, basically what I'm doing now is using this to mess with the UVs of the gradient texture. So I'm going to subtract 0 0.5 from this. And the reason I'm doing it is now we have positive and negative values. So now the values will go from minus 0.5 to 0.5, which means it's going to distort them in, in two directions because UVs have positive and negative uh, math in them, basically. So let's add in another converter. And this one is just for um, controlling how strong it is. And I'll, you'll see that in a second, what it does. And finally, what I need to add is a vector math. And then we're going to grab these, bring them together. And oh. so it's not doing what I want it to do. That's weird. I wonder if something changed. Interesting. Oh, I just I put minus 0.5 in the subtract, so it was adding to it. Obviously, yes. Um, never mind. That was my mistake. So detail doesn't need to be super high. The cool thing is, one more thing we can do to this, uh, and just to show you it, I'm going to duplicate this a couple times. Let's say we have multiple dust modes. And like I said, these are things that you're not going to see in the final render, but I put them in there because just because it's fun. So I grab the object info and add another vector math in here. So if we add this, so the random will basically, let me show you real quick give a random color from uh, white to black for each one. So if we add this into the vectors, it means, uh, and if we actually, let's multiply it after that UV vector, should work, unless I need to switch it to generator, that might be the case as well. No, I just wanna add it to this one. So we want the, Gradient to stay the same. It's getting late, I'm getting a little tired of noticing. There we go. Now let's throw in a math node here and multiply it by like a thousand. So each one of them gets a wildly different value. So basically all that's doing is just adding randomness to the um, UV coordinate for each dust mode. And like I said, this is complete overkill, but it's fun nonetheless. So let's finish up the shader make it a mixed shader. I don't think we'll be able to see anything in rendered, but that's okay. There's no lights on it. And I'm gonna grab a transparent shader and mix it just with a diffuse. So generally I have this setup done and I'll just copy it from a different file. Um, and maybe bring this down a little bit so they're not 100% opaque. There we go. There's no lights on this, which is why you can't see it, but it's no big deal. Delete these. Call this one. Actually, we'll put them in a collection so we can hide them. Dust. Turn that off. Go back. And now it's just a case of setting up the particle system. Let's grab this cube and we'll start adding it in over here. I'm gonna add a new particle system. I'm gonna set the frame start and end to minus one. So they all spawn at the same time and a bunch of nines in the lifetime so that they go on forever. Then I want it to be in the volume. There we go. Sometimes turning that on and off helps uh, to get them to look right. So now there's a bunch in here. And then for render, I'm gonna grab collection, grab the dust collection, and then we'll see what the size is that we need to render these. Now I'm gonna turn off the emitter in the render and the viewport so we just see the dust. 
There we go. Turn on rotation as well. And one of the things I want to do is turn the physics, set them to none, so it's not trying to calculate anything. And now we can just change the size, mess with the rotation. Let's see what that gives us. You know, now some dust added in. We can change the number and the seed. Um, generally, I'll do that until I find like something that works kind of well. And because they're sort of semi-transparent, they're picking up where the lighting is a little bit better, so you get a nice effect as well. Let's see. That one looks all right. Make it, maybe make them a little bit smaller. There we go, something like that. Let's leave it at that. So now I'll just render one. Save it, render it. And I can start answering some questions. So, would voxel remesher help closing the holes on the nose? It would, but then you lose all your texture coordinates, which is kind of frustrating. Um, so, yeah, you'd have to re-project the textures and it'd be a whole pain in the butt. Um, yeah. How often are you streaming? It really depends. Sometimes, yeah, I haven't streamed as much ever as the last couple of weeks, uh, just because of everything that's going on in the world right now. Um, I try to do maybe once a month, but I, even that is hard because I'm generally quite busy with all kinds of projects and things. Um, oh, there you go. So somebody already says Voxel Remesh should uh, destroy the UV data. The thing I'm waiting for to get better in Blender is text animation stuff. Yeah, it's all, it's very basic right now. Um, it could definitely use a, a coat of paint uh, to put it that way, but it works. You could do interesting things with EV as well now in 2D with text, so it's fun. Since you're only really using one picture, you could as well have used your picture in grayscale as a displacement map directly and project colors on top of it, or that it gives you a different result. So the thing with displacement is that it won't give you those like overhanging meshes. You'd have to use vector displacement for that, and um, that wouldn't necessarily work quite as well. Uh, so that's why I'm using these meshes, because you get a lot more of that weird detail and weird shape. So. That's not bad. I'd have to increase the, uh, the samples a little bit, which we'll do so I can keep answering some questions. And I'll use my brand new uh, questions thing here. Hey. Um, <clears throat> Wasn't there at one point a proposal for colored wireframes? Uh, yes, and okay, you already can. Okay, so they're in there, yeah. I actually rarely use them, but I guess they, they would have been a good option to use when we were cleaning it up. Uh, starting to look great, yeah, it looks all right. <laughs> so more about the wireframes, but that seems to have been answered. So, oh no, thanks for uh, answering that. Why did I put a cast modifier on the cube? Does it help making it perfectly round? Yes, it does indeed. Um, otherwise, it's got like a little bit of an odd shape. Um, not that it really matters, but you know, it's some of the weird quirks, I guess. The roots or veins we can see in the thumbnail are really great. Yeah, I'll show those files in a minute. Don't worry, um, we'll get to those. Uh, but I just wanted to show the full process. Well, that's doing some interesting stuff over here. There we go. It's still a little bit noisy, but it's, uh, it's doable for now, so let's load that in here and go straight to compositing. So for these, generally what I'll do is either mess with the contrast a little bit, and I tend to use the curves over here because they're a bit more responsive, so I might bring it in a little bit. So maybe add contrast, but sort of brighten the overall image. 
I really like these high contrast and very high contrast settings. Oh, there we go. That looks pretty cool. There we go. Um, and then for this series, mainly the only thing I've really been doing is maybe adding a little bit of glare, but even then, um, I don't think I did it on all the image and the usual sharpening and softening. So sharpen it up a little bit first, not too much, and then soften it out afterwards. And if we turn these off, let's see if we can see the difference. It doesn't do much and I don't know how visible it's gonna be on the stream, but it just adds a little bit of clarity if you have a lot of small detail. So this mesh isn't the best because it's low resolution, but still, you know, it works. Um, See if we can add in the glare. Uh, set the mix to one. So let's see what we have here first. Is it picking anything up? I have to bring the threshold down, it seems. Just a little bit. There we go. If you're bringing the threshold down this low, it usually means the image itself is a little bit underexposed, but um, generally I'll just crank up the samples and re-render it. So let's set this to add. See if this really does add anything to the image that helps. It's all right, but maybe just bring it down a bit. There we go. Kind of want it to catch your eye, but not really have it. go completely over the top. Kind of sad I didn't do the scan in super high resolution now. I don't know what's up with this stuff, but <laughs> it's funny. There we go, and I would consider that pretty much finished. Um, so yeah, that's it for this one. Oh, and I totally spaced and forgot to bring the thing back. Dang it, I forgot to put it full screen, sorry about that. Um, Ah, and I changed the tile size in the, instead of the samples. Yeah, it's getting late. I'm getting pretty tired. <laughs> um, so let's set this to like 768. Save it again. Do one last render and answer some more questions. Um, where does the initial mesh come from? So that came from photo scanning. Uh, and the humanoid mesh I got from the polycount wiki. Um, once the stream is archived, you can kind of scrub through it, but I don't know if it's still open. Maybe it is. Yeah, so the, the polycount wiki has a nice little base mesh bus that you could use uh, to start with. Uh, God raise, please. Yes. <laughs> I use way too much volumetric, so just fun to use. Uh, okay, so people are uh, answering some of the stuff there. Volume cube probably didn't show because it was set to wire in the viewport display. No, it should have shown. In cycles, it does show. In Eevee, it doesn't. I know there's issues with it uh, in Eevee, but in cycles, it should just show normally. So um, I'm kind of surprised that it didn't, to be completely honest. Uh, but like I said, it might be down to my build of Blender because I do bad things to it. Um, What is my computer setup graphics cards? Uh, I'm going to change over here. If you look at the very top of the screen, it's in there. Um, can we see for a second what it looks like with color? Sure, I can turn on the color in just a sec. Um, <laughs> Control S, yes, definitely saved. Uh, do I find myself using the EID noiser often? More for animations than anything else. Um, I'm getting a lot of weird noise here. I don't know what's going on, but it's less noisy when it starts rendering and it's more noisy when it ends rendering. That's something's up. Let's turn off the adaptive sampling for a second and see what that says. That might help. Um, so yeah, the, the AI denoiser I tend to use a lot for animation um, just because it's great for that kind of thing. For example, if I'm doing VJ stuff, um, I've gotten a lot more requests for 4K stuff. So I'm using it for that kind of thing quite a bit uh, just because it can save a lot of time. So uh, 
Uh, thanks, Sosua. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, reminds me of Dave McKean's Photoshop illustrations. Oh, thank you. You make some really cool stuff. Another colored version. Yeah, we'll try it in a second. Um, how many pics did the photo scan take? I can't remember. Uh, how many was it? 34 images. So definitely not what I would usually um, use. Uh, most photo scan, if I'm like actually really trying to photo scan something at a super high resolution, it's usually between about 150 and 250 images on uh, with my camera, which is a Sony a7R2, which is almost like an 8K image that it photographs. Um, but that's for like really extreme stuff. And then you'll get meshes that are like 10, 20 million polygons if you really crank everything up. And I've hit, I've had times where I've got 64 gigs of RAM in this machine. Um, and that is even not always enough to process all of those. And I might have to drop down the quality a little bit, but. Um, do I stream much and wait into this procedural stuff? Yeah, I've already kind of answered that sometimes. I try to do as many streams as I can, but unfortunately I'm quite busy uh, with client work and teaching and that kind of thing. So um, as much as I can, but don't expect me to be like a full on YouTube streamer, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, thank you for your time to show this awesome tutorial. Oh, thank you. Um, you're very welcome. So let's let this run. It's another 50 seconds or so. So let's let it run. Come on. Also, generally, when I'm rendering stuff like this, um, I'm rendering it at like 8 or 9K for the final image for print. So if we bring back uh, the original images here. Let's see. Let's go into render. Uh, here you can see like the print version of this last one, for example. You can really zoom in and see all see all the details. So this is how big I end up uh, printing them. So this is seven seven thousand two hundred by nine thousand pixels. Um, I render them this big, not only because I want to be able to print them really huge um, and hang them up in my own office, um, but that's also the resolution that ArtStation needs. So if you like this stuff, just shamelessly plug here for a second, which I normally don't do, but seeing that we're waiting anyway, um, I actually have prints that you can buy. There we go. Um, so if you're ever interested, you can buy prints and if you ever want uh, a signed copy, um, go to my website and send me an email and then I, I can print it locally and sign it. Um, I've had people ask now the last six months or so, it's it's first ones have passed. So that was kind of cool. All right, so this this version, let's uh, hit up a second slot here. Hit escape. Let's have a look at the colored version real quick. Uh, no, back to materials. Select this dude. Where are we? There we go. And I'm just going to turn off the human saturation. So that's what the colored version would look like. So that's also pretty cool. Um, I don't know. I'm just obsessed with black and white for some reason. I, I really like it. So cool. Okay. I think uh, that's about it for tonight. I'll answer the last few questions. So if you have them, uh, um, yeah, ask away. But um, I'll quickly open up some of the other files as well. So let's open, I'll open the last one. And then after that, I'll, I'll answer the questions and then uh, we can wrap it up. Come on. This is going to take a while. So this is why I kept the resolution of the mesh and everything else quite low tonight, um, because this is kind of what you're dealing with when, <laughs> when you use super high res meshes. There's a lot of waiting involved. Um, oh, there we go. Let me close this. So here you can see the resolution of the mesh is kind of bonkers. So again, I did this in four pieces. I sliced them up slightly differently. Um, 
but yeah the mesh resolution is definitely a, a lot higher than the other one and um, I can show you the images of what I was what I found as well it was this cool tree that I saw in the forest while I was taking a walk um, where did I put these scans oh, I hope I can just show this let's just open a random one and see what it does there we go. So it was this weird tree with all these weird looking veins on it. Um, I think it was some kind of fungus or something. It was a, a dead tree that had fallen over. Um, and it had all these like strands and things on them. So maybe try one of these. There you go. So this is where that strandy look comes from. So um, yeah, I just saw an opportunity. I was like, hey, this looks really cool, like for a texture or something. I want to try and figure it out. And um, here you can see the, uh, what is it, almost 8K of the camera. So if I zoom in, these are the pictures that I'm using for it. And you can see the resolution is quite, quite crazy. And that will give you a super high res scan uh, to work with. Because these meshes have already been decimated quite a bit. They were, they're now, I think this one is 4 million faces. I think they were like close to 10 or 12 when they came in to Blender first. So I decimated the ever living crap out of them just to get it to work a little bit faster. And then I redid the mapping a few times until I got like the, the feeling that it sort of wraps around the face. Um, so I put a, put a bit more time in these than I did the one tonight, but it just gives you an idea. I'll open the first one as well, because um, the second one was done with the same, the same set of pictures and the same mesh. But the first one, uh, let's see, I'm not gonna save any changes. That one was actually done with um, with my phone as well. So uh, I just took the time to really carefully photograph every single piece and get super close up to it and take a whole bunch of pictures. Um, I can't remember how many there were, but I think it was around 100, maybe more. Um, and I was very selective with, uh, with the pictures that I took. You can see it's a little bit lower res just because of the, the camera. Uh, and if you look at the large image, like in this part here, you get sort of a little bit of weird distortion. And you can see some of these meshes aren't even stuck together properly, but you can hide it well with a bit of lighting and, uh, and some other stuff. So here you'll see the same thing. Um, and this is really nice. I think for this one, what I did for the shader is I added in a little bit of, where are we? Uh, adding a little bit of subsurface as well, just to give it that very wet look um, so that it had subsurface. And then I uh, cranked up the reflections as well and threw in some extra stuff. So it really depends. Some of them have a little bit of shininess on them, otherwise other ones don't. So um, like for this last one, if I go back, I keep closing them, don't I? Yeah. So for this first one, you can see there's a lot of shininess. And then for the second one, there's a lot of shininess in there as well. And the third one is a little bit rougher. And here you can actually see the, the wood of the tree that's underlying those uh, creepy creepy sort of strands. So yeah, uh, let's, uh, let's finish up with some last questions and then uh, I think it'll be about time to go for me. So let's see. Um, what's my favorite food? <sighs> Man, um, I really like uh, spaghetti bolognese with walnuts. Um, and I'm a total Belgian when it comes to food because I like mashed potatoes and, and uh, red cabbage and applesauce. That shit is amazing. Um, and fries, Belgian fries. It's a big thing here in Belgium. It's very specific, but um, yeah, I'd say those would be about the three, my three favorite foods, I guess. So, uh, yeah. How much hours do I spend with a PC per day? <laughs> An unhealthy amount, let's put it that way. Um, between 10 and 14 maybe. Um, I guess not every day. I have meetings and stuff I need to go to, but on average, like on a day like today, um, yeah, it's noon. I, I started around noon, so it's almost 
11 o'clock now and I'm definitely going to stay up for another hour or two just watching movies and doing more Blender stuff. So easily 10 to 12 hours uh, on, a, on a normal day. Uh, a Blender Angel, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Um, so why do most people use C4D for this kind of abstract and procedural workflow? Um, I don't know. It just got known as a motion graphics tool and it's got a, re a bunch of really, really great stuff in it. Um, I guess Houdini's become more popular for that kind of stuff as well. I just like Blender because of the open sourceness of it. And, and yeah, that's kind of why I stick with it because I, I prefer something like that. Actually, I'll leave that up. Um, but yeah. I think it, it made its name as motion graphic stuff. There's some modules in there that are really amazing for doing um, like really uh, run of the mill MoGraph stuff. So, but in my mind, I think Blender and Houdini is just as powerful if you want to get into the super crazy stuff. And if you look at like the, what I showed today, uh, even with photo scanning and a bit of creativity, you can get results that look like they come from those other applications, I guess. But um yeah, it's, I just like Blender. I don't know. I like Blender. I like the community. I like the way they think. Um, yeah, that's kind of the reason I, I stick with it. So, uh, <laughs> Just arrived. Okay, well, the, the archive should be up fairly quickly after I end the stream. It sort of does it automatically, so. Um, they're a bit creepy. What's my inspiration direction? Um, yeah, I like nature lately. I've been making more creepy stuff. I don't know why, I guess, uh, I just like that kind of thing. Um, my inspiration comes from everywhere. I'll walk down the street and maybe see something like a pattern on a wall or something. And, and it starts from there. It could be anything to be completely honest. So, uh, well, thanks for joining Sebastian. So, Hi, will you do another motion design tutorial different on the Blender Cloud? I don't know what the future holds. I definitely want to do a bigger course, but I, I'm not sure yet how to how to approach it. I don't know if it will be on the Blender Cloud or not. I haven't really thought about it yet, but I would love to do something like that. So my freelancer company employee, I'm a freelancer. Uh, do you do a lot of work on Eevee? I've started to use it more and more. Yeah, Eevee's fun. Um, we can actually just as a final little thing, uh, just to have fun with it. For something like this, Eevee works surprisingly well. So um, I don't know how perfectly it will translate, but let's just set it to Eevee. Yeah, the lights are a little bit bright in this case, um, but you could e use Eevee just as much for this. Uh, yeah, there you go. I've had it where when I switch over, it's quite similar. Yeah, oh, there you go. You now it calculated it. So with Eevee even, it looks pretty cool. The only thing you'd have to do, I guess, to make this work, just to finalize it, is in the settings here, uh, you'd have to set the blend mode to alpha blend, and then you would get the proper um, blending of the dust particles. So then the, the transparency would work properly. Uh, and then we could set this to alpha hashed as well for the shadow mode. But there you go. I mean, even in Eevee, you can do really, really interesting imagery as well. And I feel like the, the bump map, even as extreme as it is, might even work a little bit better in here. So cool. So that seems to be it for the questions. Um, thank you all for joining at a really nice time. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it as well. And um, yeah, I guess I'll see you all in the future. Have a good night. Stay safe and uh, see you soon. <laughs> bye bye.